I'm Jeff O'Keefe. I'm the executive director of Zen Peacemakers, and I welcome everybody. What a nice, uh, what a nice uh, uh, response we're getting this morning. So thank you so much for your time. Um, we we have been interested in talking about uh, what we refer to as uh, internally, I guess, uh, and, and perhaps more broadly, as dual belonging, um, where we have people who are uh, either teachers or, or seniors who really have a foot in, in both the, the Zen world or the Buddhist world more broadly. And in this case, the, the, the Catholic world, we have members in Zen Peacemakers who are uh, transmitted teachers in the Zen lineage, but are also Sufis and uh, Christian ministers and uh, priests and rabbis. So this is not a new concept and it's something we just wanted to be because uh, commitment to interfaith um, uh, inclusion and activity is really part of our founding mission. Uh, it's something we wanted to speak to a little more specifically. So uh, we reached out and uh, kindly our friend uh, Father Michael Holleran Sensei uh, agreed to come and and speak with us and share about that. And he, in fact, um, is uh, um, in that tradition of dual belonging. How should we say? Uh, Michael is a, a Jesuit priest and also uh, a sensei and a successor of uh, Father Robert Kennedy Roshi, who is a successor of Bernie Glassman. So uh, these these connections are are intimate. And uh, and really personal and uh, and uh, so we're we're very happy to have Michael uh, join us today and uh, and you came to listen to him not me so I will uh, I will uh, uh, introduce Michael he uh, the title of Michael's talk today is World Traditions Beyond World Traditions and I'm very keen to hear uh, what he has to say so uh, there will be time and please uh, if you can please. Stay with us. There will be time for uh, questions and answers and perhaps some dialogue and conversation uh, after Michael's talk. So, Michael, with that, I will hand you the uh, virtual talking stick. And once again, thank you sincerely for your kindness and your time and your heart today. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thanks for this uh, opportunity. Um, uh, I'm uh, very delighted to be here. I do apologize for a couple of things. The internet connection is a little stable sometimes. I'm in a new lodging. I just moved last week. Uh, the wall behind me was painted two days ago. I've got books and box of me. Uh, so I'm, uh, it's a little in disarray, but then life is kind of like that, isn't it? Um, so uh, uh, hopefully you can uh, you can uh, follow me and hear me, but I apologize for any uh, the difficulties. Um, the title "World Tradition Beyond World Traditions" uh, several meanings to that. World traditions beyond our own world traditions. So we have the double belonging and triple belonging. We we go to other world traditions beyond our own, but also within our own tradition. Certainly in Christianity. Uh, we find our world tradition beyond the world tradition that we have, that has evolved. So the world tradition as we have it is not always fully faithful to what it really is if you go back and examine it more deeply. And that's especially what I'd like to talk about and where I think Buddhism and Zen can help us, help Christians to recover their own tradition. So, uh, a part of that is, you know, even the Buddha criticized the, the, the religious traditions of his own time and launched out. Jesus did the same. So this is uh, the great masters of, 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 have always done this uh, and things do evolve. Um, one of the first things I'd like to talk about is, is God. All right. So many people say Buddhism is atheist. Uh, Stephen Batchelor and others, as you know, secular Buddhism. Uh, my own tour guide in Myanmar when I was there seven years ago, a native Buddhist practitioner said it was Buddhism is humanism, which if you actually understand humanism doesn't exclude God. But anyway, um, 
So the, the main problem is the word God. You know, we, uh, the, some Orthodox Jews don't even use the O, they just put the GD because you can't say the word, you can't, uh, in the Kabbalah, the, uh, the highest name for God is nothing. Sounds Buddhist, right? Um, the, uh, but if you go back to the tradition, the early tradition in the, in the, in the church, you, you have people like John Chrysostom, whose, whose feast we celebrated yesterday, the, the great patriarch of Constantinople, he wrote a whole treatise against Eunomia saying that there's no name that's suitable for God. No name is adequate, you can't, including God. So you can't, you can't say that. Augustine has, St. Augustine has a famous phrase, si comprehenderis non es Deus. If you've understood it, if you've grasped it, if you've conceptualized it, it ain't God. God is beyond all that. Hmm? So those who believe that God really is an old man with a beard sitting up on some throne on some planet in some galaxy, well, well for, me, for them I'd be an atheist because that's not who God, what God is or who God is. Uh, so we need to purify those naive notions uh, and, and get away to, you know, what, well, vast boundlessness. St. Augustine himself in the fifth century already said that God is, God is infinite being, not our being, not even the supreme being, which is one thing the catechism says, uh, but being itself. So infinite being. So there's, there's nothing, nothing uh, possible that you can say that is adequate to the notion of God. So uh, infinite being, and that's what, what uh, St. Thomas also said, uh, infinite uh, subsistent infinite being. So uh, in that context, then, if you have infinite being, well, then it excludes nothing. It's just pure boundlessness, vast, boundless. And that's, that's an image that, that Zen uses a lot as well. Uh, but there are very few, even in Christianity, who understand that the infinite being, you know, excluding nothing, is what we're talking about here. Uh, but at the same time, if that's the case, then uh, in, in especially in Mahayana Buddhism, in Zen, what you have is the emptiness is form, and form is emptiness. So infinite being includes all of being, including form. And this is something very, very profound, you know, in, in Christianity, where we speak about incarnation and Christ, where uh, God and, 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 and creation are one, God and humanity are one. Uh, so relative and absolute go together, as you know, from the sutras, you know, like a box and its lid, you know, like two arrows meeting in midair, like one, one foot walking in front of another. Uh, so uh, Christianity and, and, and especially Mahayana and Zen sh should, should be on the same page here, where there's, there's non-separation, where there's a non-duality between, between uh, the relative and the absolute. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, in, in Christ Catholic, Christian theology, that's simply called Christ. Richard Rohr has a, a, a new book on that called The Universal Christ, which reminds us you know, of what the original tradition was. If you go back to the letters uh, in the New Testament, the Colossians and 1 Corinthians, uh, where it says that Christ is all and in all. Christ is all in all. It's basically the union of relative and absolute, created and uncreated, if you use Christian words. You don't have to, but, but it's all of reality. So Christ is all in all. And you're not going to hear that preached from any pulpit certainly not the evangelical pulpit, but not from a Catholic pulpit either, even though that's exactly what the New Testament says. We have to reclaim our tradition, realizing that all of being is included in the reality that we call God, call Christ. Christ is all in all. Hmm? Uh, and in 1 Corinthians, it says God will be all in all. So it's not just in all, God in all or Christ in all, it's all in all, everything in everything and everyone. That's what we're talking about. So everything and everyone is Christ, is the body of Christ. And as we know perfectly well from the koans and from our own training, everything is the Buddha, everyone is the Buddha, everything is connected. It's all the Buddha and it's all Christ. There's no contradiction here or a separation between these, these, these uh, 
traditions and what they see as the ultimate reality. That there's, call it, you know, what Thich Nhat Hanh calls it, interbeing. All things and all people are interconnected with all things, you know, relative and absolute are interconnected. Uh, there's no separation. You know, emptiness is form and form is emptiness. Uh, and that's, some go even further, of course. Uh, some, some speak of Sufis, some Muslim traditions, Jewish traditions, you know, uh, Ravi Rami Shapiro or J. Michelson say that all is God. It's another way of saying it, all is God. Or modern process theology speaks about, you know, the different aspects of God, the absolute and the relative, you know, expressing itself in this in the same way. Uh, the modern Catholic mystic Bernadette Peters speaks about, you know, when we say we're created from nothing, as the Jewish name for God, remember, nothing. It means we're created from God and out of God, not from some nothingness other than God. So people like Bernadette recognize this isn't exactly orthodox language. People get in trouble for this. But it's basically saying that there's no separation, that everything is a reflection of God. Ellen, Roshi Ellen Burks, who's, uh, who's Roshi Kennedy's uh, successor as well, has a new book called Embracing the Inconceivable. So inconceivable is what we're talking about, God, and it's inconceivable, it's that ultimate reality. And as she says very well, many times in the book, we are, we are manifestations of the inconceivable ultimate reality. And that's perfectly orthodox to say as, uh, as Christians, because she is a Christian as well, a practicing Christian as well as a, as a, as a, as a Zen Roshi. Uh, so that's a, 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 another way of saying that. Hmm? Uh, the interconnectedness of everything uh, has many beautiful images. Indra's net, you know, in Hinduism, or or uh, or Manjushri's uh, golden-haired lion, in which every hair reflects every other hair. It's it's uh, it's holographic, you know, a very modern understanding, scientific understanding of how every reality exp re expresses and reflects every other reality. You know quantum uh, quantum mechanics and uh, quantum interconnection uh, expresses itself there. Uh, so everything is interconnected. You know, in, in that according to those images, uh, etc., and, and everywhere. The only way to access this, though, and this is so important. This is where again Buddhism and other traditions can help Christianity reclaim. The only way we can we can we can grasp this, or not be grasped by it, or, or connect to it, is through contemplative practice is through practice. Yeah. Um, Buddhism puts a much greater emphasis on practice, a contemplative practice, than Christianity traditionally has. But once you wake up and rediscover all the great contemplative riches going back to the fathers of the church and the great Carmelite mystics and you know, all the great medieval mystics, you see that there is this whole tradition you know, of, of, of contemplative practice where you can experience this for yourself. That there's no separation between you and Christ. You know, sometimes it's expressed in, in spousal marital imagery, you know, uh, but there's really non-duality there. Just as husband and wife become one flesh, St. Paul says, whoever's joined to Christ becomes one spirit. <laughs> There it is. Yeah, but we we need to regain our practice. When I was in Japan some years ago, some years ago with my interfaith group, the Global Peace Institute of Women, the Contemplative Alliance, uh, I was asked to give a talk on Christian contemplation to 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 Japanese Buddhist practitioners. And they all were there, you know, basically, you know, uh, in their in the contemplative you know posture. And the first thing that they were astonished at was, was there's contemplation in Christianity? There's contemplation in Christianity? Because that wasn't what they were exposed to when Christianity came to Japan or preachers came to Japan. So it's, it's, it's sad that we have this vast you know, tradition, which has luckily been revived by people like Thomas Merton and uh, the, uh, the uh, contemplative outreach, uh, uh, centering prayer, et cetera, which I also practice here in my parish as well as the my zendo. Uh, so it's when we go deeply into our practice, we can be and begin to experience uh, this, these realities. So in relation, so the reform of the notion of God and the great Protestant theologian, Paul Tillich said, you know, half a century ago, we should have a hundred year moratorium on the word God. Let's stop using the word because we're totally misusing it. It becomes blasphemy. So you see why because we think we know what we're talking about. And if we do know what we're talking about, 
Uh, it ain't what we're talking about. It's you comprehend the reason on its day as if you've understood it, if you've conceptualized it, it's not God. Hmm? So um, but the consequence of this, and this I've often considered to be the greatest contribution of Buddhism to Western civilization, philosophy as well as religion, is the notion of the self, the person. Right? There ain't no self. Hmm? It's, it's, it's very liberating, but very terrifying news to Westerners that who they think they are isn't who they are because they're thinking it or their mind, uh, this is elementary stuff really for, for those who practice, but that, you know, their mind and their thoughts and their opinions and their memories and all that stuff, that's not who they are. But again, you have to move beyond all that through practice in order to experience that and know that for yourself. I like the, I like the expression transpersonal because personal may be adequate in itself, but it becomes identified with individual. Uh, a person is an individual. Well, no, a person is relational consciousness. Even in the Trinity, <laughs> it's relational consciousness. So that's who we are. Call it transpersonal, beyond anything that's limited, because we're Christ, because we're the Buddha. That's who we are. Now, if people really live that and recognize interbeing that they're related to everyone and everything. Imagine what that would do to, to society. Wow, that person over there is me. That person over there is Christ. That person over there is the Buddha. I mean, it's pers not the person over there, it's me. There's no separation. This is what we need to recover and what we need to live by uh, in relationship. Uh, so, uh, and of course, this is, of course, is what the Buddha's own enlightenment was, remember? In the Denko Roku or whatever translation you follow there, you know. As you, as the morning star woke him up, so to speak, as he woke up to the morning star, he said, "I and all beings in the great, you know, uh, all the great earth and all beings, you know, have have achieved uh, enlightenment. I found found the way. I and the I that said that was not no longer Shakyamuni, separate, but the Buddha awake, awake, and all beings are simultaneously awake when that happens." Hmm? because it's just one conscious reality. Um, so, uh, so all that uh, the nation, notion that's off, the, the, the contract, contrasting notions often in Christianity and Buddhism, one is other power, one is self-power. Jiriki, tariki, I think is the expression in Japanese. Uh, you see how that vanishes, you know. There's no other, or put better, there is the other as long as I'm my egotistical self in, in my limited consciousness and, and erroneous self-awareness, self then there's the other. But it's coming from most deeply within me. My ego has no control over it. This is where humility comes in, where, where, where the sacrifice comes in, where, where uh, you know, your totally, total self-gift comes in. You just let go of all of that. But that's by the power of what's coming up from with, deep within you. Uh, which is your deepest reality. Um, uh, so the other power, self power, vanishes. The self, there's no self power because it's when, as long as the ego is involved in doing it, as often happens in practice, by the way, you just big ego trip in the beginning, very often that has to, that has to stop, that has to be purified away because that's not the self power. The self, you might call the Jungian capital S self, or the, the true self, if you want to use some modern Christian Tom Merton language. Yes, okay, but not that self, which is an illusion. So uh, once people can realize what an incredible liberation, I'm so glad I'm free from myself. Oh. Uh, and this is where the question also of immortality comes in. Hmm. So what is immortal? Christ. Well, Christ who exactly? And this is where I think, you know, the, the Christian message of resurrection of the body actually has something to say. Because if, in fact, emptiness is form and form is emptiness, then the form, although in its customary form and time and space, is no longer there. What has been gained in form and through form call it the rainbow body in Tibetan, call it the, the resurrected body of Christ, 
uh, call it the whole cosmos, which is the body of Christ and is the Buddha. Yeah, that is somehow maintained in energetic form that what has been gained in time. Is, so it's not just a return to the one and what happened in time is just an accident and you know forget about it. But there is, is something gained and something that remains. Hmm? Uh, and uh, uh, any, any kind of reincarnation debate has to be, uh, has to be included in that. Uh, to use Hindu terms, it, if, there, if there is any kind of in reincarnation understanding of it, it's not, it's not the jivatman, the incarnate soul that reincarnates, but it is the higher soul and the one that reincarnates. Uh, I'm not taking a position here, I'm just, but I am pointing out that in, in esoteric Christian and Jewish and Muslim tradition, I believe, but certainly Christian and Jewish, reincarnation is taken for granted understood in this sense that the higher soul takes different forms. But what we actually gain, what is actually gained through individual incarnations is somehow preserved. I call it the rainbow. But Cynthia Bourgeau is very eloquent on this if you want to read her in her book, The uh, Holy Trinity and the Law of Three, uh, in which she says, she insists that what is, what is lived in time is, is, is not lost. Whatever is authentic about it uh, is, uh, is preserved. And if emptiness is form and form is emptiness, then that should be obvious. I think, I think the, the image, and this is also quoted by Rabbi Rami Shapiro also, uh, that's a very Zen image of the water in the ocean, uh, the wave in the ocean. You know, there's no separation or difference in kind really between them. The wave is the ocean, but and the ocean is the wave, but the wave is not the whole ocean. So you can't say I'm God. That's an ego trip. But you see, there's this, the, this just the wave in the ocean. And the wave may disappear, but the wave is still there somehow hmm? uh, in the whole. Hmm? There's a lot of really fascinating st stuff here, of course. Um, the two other main things I really want to talk about here. Uh, today says September 14th, um, uh, propitiously or uh, fortuitously, if you will is the Feast of the Holy Cross in Christianity, in the Catholic liturgy, Feast of the Cross. And I've read and I've seen, you know, Buddhist practitioners saying, what is all this stuff about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and that somehow redeems us? What is that all about? Okay, let's look at this carefully. On the one hand, we do need to go back and a lot of theologians have been doing this, you know, for a couple of decades now at the very least. What are we talking about original sin and all this for? What we really mean in the myth of the fall is, is that we're, all, we're in space and time and matter and choice and chance. And that is automatically going to involve sin and error. So that's what it's really all about. Here we are in a place that needs redemption. Call it what you want, but it, it needs work. How is that different from what Buddhism has discovered too? And what the Buddha himself discovered, you know, that life is suffering, the life is inadequate. And the three poisons of greed, hatred, and ignorance, same. So along comes someone who wakes up or who is awake, a Christ, a Buddha, or an individual Jesus or Shakyamuni who embodies this in, in more, than, more than most, uh, almost perfectly or perfectly, in Jesus' case, I would say. Um, so approaching these people as wisdom figures, rather than saying savior, et cetera. And this is what Cynthia does and others are doing now. But Jesus as a wisdom figure, and the Buddha as a wisdom figure, who is showing the way, showing the way to, us to get out of this uh, and to, wake up to our union with, with the absolute reality and to live out of that union and out of that consciousness. Hmm? Um, but the notion that, you know, Jesus redeemed us through his suffering because he had to pay a price to his angry father, who is a bloodthirsty, almost sadistic God who requires this bloody sacrifice in order to be appeased. All right, this is monstrous. This is horrible. 
that's a deformation of, of the, what a true understanding should be. Read Elizabeth Johnson, Sister Elizabeth Johnson's uh, book, Creation on the Cross, in which she demolishes you know, this and the terrible consequences it's had. What is true is that Jesus went into the depths of cruel, unjust suffering that he suffered himself, uh, went into the depths of human sin by taking it on himself, by suffering it, you know, and having compassion on it. So it was not the pain that, 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 that pacified an angry God, but it was taking on the pain of human existence. All the sin and suffering that was, that was thrown at him, you know, healing people during his life, and then while on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. And in the midst of feeling abandoned by what he called his father, who he called his father, saying, into your hands I commend my spirit. That kind of forgiveness and trust and compassion and love in the midst of the worst possible suffering, that is what redeemed the world. It changed reality. It changed the face of it. changed the energy forces in reality so that that was now his love and his, you know, Christic, you know, uh, uh, compassion and forgiveness uh, became uh, effective uh, fully in the cosmos. Hmm? And the Buddha showed people the same way, took, took on human, you know, took on the, 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 the show how to deal with human suffering, uh, not to be, uh, to be uh, overwhelmed by it, but to wake up to it and show compassion, universal compassion on all sentient beings along the way. Uh, and then to forgive. Don't forget that the story of his own death, you know, where he was accidentally poisoned, you know, by, uh, by someone and he, he said, don't worry about it. And that's, that's the same kind of, <laughs> same kind of uh, trust in, 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 in reality uh, in the midst of, you know, a suffering that came upon him, you know, you'd say unjustly or unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. uh, so wisdom figures that take on uh, the suffering of humanity mm -hmm. um, and show the way through and guide the way through still because we believe we believe that Jesus the Christ and even Shakyamuni the Buddha still are forces in the cosmos perfectly united to the Christic energy, the Buddha energy, which is the same in the end. Uh, that's how it works. Hmm? So we are impelled maybe by Buddhist, you know, Buddhist questions, you know, to go back and re-examine our own Christian emphases, which have gone talk about world traditions beyond world traditions that have gone way, way out of whack here uh, in a language that, you know, many young people don't understand today. What do you mean Jesus saves me from my sins by dying on the cross? What do you mean how? Well, this is how. And this is the way we can also not only understand our own tradition better in Christianity, but also uh, speak to, uh, see, see how we can connect with other traditions and how they deal with the human condition of suffering and sin, which is what Buddha talks about too. You know? Uh, so we just have to engage in practice and in, in a wisdom tradition to enable us to deal with that in our own lives and, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And finally, this is a subject of the last chapter in Paul Nitter's book. Uh, uh, and he does speak also about Jesus as the wisdom figure in, in that book as well, in the same way that Cynthia does, a uh, similar way. Um, how do we deal with what is our mission in the world, therefore, uh, to express and manifest compassion uh, to our all suffering sentient beings, our fellow fellow, not just humans, but the whole planet, you know, because we're all one. You know? Christ is the snail as well as the human, you know, and so is the Buddha, as you know, uh, and all things. So uh, I think, you know, this, this is one way Christianity, in one sense, can teach Buddhism something. Maybe the emphasis on the individual in the West has one good side to it, at least, is the rights of the human rights, the rights of the human person. I don't think that's given as, has been given as much emphasis in history in the Buddhist traditions, because they went right to the absolute, really. They didn't emphasize so much the individual and their rights. So... Uh, expressing compassion and respect in that way. Uh, and I would dare to say, and I'm open to contradiction here, I would dare say that 
Bernie Glassman's you know, openness to engaged Buddhism and socially engaged Buddhism owes at least as much to his Jewish tradition as it does to his Zen tradition in practice, in fact. But both, you know, obviously move in that direction. And people like Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, very much engaged social Buddhism, but inspired by and impelled by, you know, the Vietnam War. So he was he was pushed in that direction, I would say, to uh, to to that um, through historical circumstance in a way that other Zen practitioners throughout history may not have been. Um, in any case, what Paul spends a lot of time on in the book is how Buddhism can teach us, nonetheless, in the midst of our social action, and you know, also you know, preach to itself how to do this. And Thich Nhat Hanh is very good. He was quoted by Paul. Um, you have to be peace first. In order to make peace and justice, you have to be peace first. So on the one hand, in the Christianity, we might say, if you want peace, seek justice. In Buddhism, you turn it around. If you want justice, be peace. Because, and this is something Richard Rohr is very strong with in his Center for Action and Contemplation, my good friend Richard Rohr. Uh, if you want to work for action, in action, you have to be a contemplative first. Otherwise, you're going to mess it up. It's just going to be a big anger, ego trip, or, or, or it's it, it easily gets out of out of uh, out of whack uh, if you're not rooted, you know, in contemplation, in in that in that oneness. Uh, so that, uh, as Thich Nhat Hanh pointed out, you know, if if you're if you're going into you know, as Paul Nader did, going into El Salvador and working, you know. Uh, uh, are you just in continuing or augmenting or increasing the oppositional energy, the duality? You know, I'm fighting them and they're fighting me, and you keep that same dynamic. That won't get you anywhere. You can't have that approach of you know angry fighting against. You have to recognize your oneness, and that's what Bernie, as he Paul, Paul quotes Bernie. Bernie told him, if you're going to El Salvador, realize you are the death squads. You are the death squads. Not that you would do it in similar circumstances, but you actually are. There's no separation. They are you, not just the victims, but the perpetrators. That's what we have to realize if we're ever going to actually do any action for justice and peace is realize that our opponents are us. There's no separation. Live that interbeing, live that connection, live that oneness, uh, non-separation, the non-duality. That's the only way we can really work for peace. Hmm? Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh reminded uh, reminded the uh, uh, others who were working in that in, 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 uh, uh, the same thing. I remember on 9-11 itself, the actual day, uh, Janet Abels, who was a sensei at the time, you know, one of uh, Roshi Kennedy's first successors who now runs Still Mind Zendo in uh, New York City. Um, she said to me, right, I think it might have been the day after 9-11. We, we both lived in Greenwich Village, you know, a mile away from the horrible scene. And she said, remember, we are the terrorists. They are us. So right in the midst of it, she, she was awake. She was reminding us that there's no separation. There's no us and them. Anytime there's us and them, you're not awake. I repeat, anytime there's us and them, you're not awake. Because it really is all in non-duality. Hmm? So this is the way we can move forward you know, in our world today. Uh, and I think that's both the result of our contemplative practice, the inspiration for our contemplative practice and for our action in the world, that there's no separation, non-duality, which is becoming more and more popular in the, in the Christian tradition now and prayer tradition with Cynthia and others, um, Richard Rohr, there's non-duality, there's no separation, no separation between anybody, among anybody, no separation with anything, no separation between us and the absolute. So, how religions can come together in this divided world, how social classes can come together, how races can come together, how sexual orientations can come together, how people of all types can come together and realize that is by realizing their oneness. They're already realized basic, inalienable, fundamental, substantial uh, you know, oneness uh, and non-separation. And non-separation with animals and plants and the whole universe as well. So we take care of that as it takes care of us, or, or, or do we not? If you chop down that tree over there, maybe you're chopping off your, your hand. You're all one body, the body of Christ, the body of the Buddha. And it's all one. 
So this is what we really need in our world today, right? And so if we can have these traditions working together and remedying each other and inspiring each other and collaborating with each other and corroborating each other, that's the way we can move forward. And in these areas where we especially need it today, where the world and the country, the, the, the churches are so divided on so many issues, uh, whereas this contemplative practice, uh, these contemplative practices uh, and these traditions can help us uh, to live in a way uh, that's uh, in fully in conformity to our own humanity and to the deepest inspirations and desires of uh, all the religious traditions of the world. All right, well, I've gotten myself into enough trouble already, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Michael, thank you. Uh, and good trouble it is, isn't it? Uh, good trouble. Oh, yes, I hope so. As John Lewis would say. Um, yes. we, friends, we have some time. We still have a wonderful group of, of uh, attending. And um, I think we'd. Uh, uh, Michael is uh, willing to do some Q&A and, and back and forth discussion. And uh, I really encourage everyone to just relax and join in community and, and share your thoughts. If you have questions, if you have an observation, something to add or a personal perspective. There are more people than I can see on one screen. So uh, I'm not sure that this is the same on all devices, but in Zoom, under reactions, if you click reactions, there is a raise hand and uh, that will move you up into the lower left, upper left hand corner and I'll be able to see you. So if you'd, if you'd like to ask a question or, or make a comment, uh, please do raise your electronic hand if you do this, I won't be able to see you necessarily. You might be on, you might be on page two. You might be uh, in the newspaper business. You might be below the fold. So uh, uh, please. Uh, no, you're all part of the fold. You're all part of the fold. <laughs> it's one. It's one newspaper. Um, so uh, uh, please join in and, uh, and and share as you are called. Thank you. And Michael, I'll 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 watch for for hands and I'll I'll. Uh, I'll call people as they come in. Sure, I tend to uh, I tend to stun people a little bit first. You have to get get with it. Excuse me a second. And uh, my friend uh, Brian Joshin Burns. Hi, Joshin. You have your hand up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael. Thank you. Um, you spoke a lot about the oneness of life. Um, Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also have the diversity of life and the harmony of oneness and diversity. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about where you have been challenged to maintain a dual practice, either theologically or from a perspective of orthodoxy, a word you used a bit. Um, yeah, we see where the perennial religion kind of shows up in these traditions and these notions of oneness. But what about difference? Are there places where you are challenged to um, be a dual practitioner? Well, I, I think I've, I've, I've come to the positions I was talking about through, through uh, you know, wrestling with these issues, you know, especially, for example, regarding your redemption and salvation and uh, uh, understanding of, you know, who the person is. Uh, you could say I've been challenged all, all through this, but it was through a deep Christian practice, a contemplative practice. As, as you may know, I was, a, I was a contemplative silent monk for more than 20 years. You know, so I was thrust right into, you know, what it was all about, what it really should be all about. Our connection with the absolute and with one another. Uh, I can say that I've never uh, felt that there was a contradiction or something I couldn't resolve. I've never felt that. No. Uh, uh, I do say I do say that we can never, uh, and this is something that the, the interfaith movement has discovered over the decades, uh, on the level of concepts, you know, God, no God, or whatever. We're, we're, we're never going to we can't agree because concepts are 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 are, are too too uh, too rough and and, and too uh, hardened. Uh, they have these jagged edges and you can't really work them down. But it's only on the level of religious experience and contemplation that you can see. Oh, 
these traditions are pointing in the same direction. You know, whether you say original sin or you say the three poisons. Oh, okay. And so maybe we can maybe reconcile the two if we look at them more closely. How how do they how do they uh, how do they compare when you actually start practicing? And you know, can they come together higher up? Uh, so it's it, it's it's only on that level of, of of practice, you know, a contemplative practice that I think you can uh, uh, resolve any issues that might come up. But as I say, you know, because of my background and my long practice, I, I, I've never had a, a contradiction that really disturbed me or that I couldn't resolve. Joshin, thank you. And I'm not saying, you know, I, obviously there are differences, you know, in, in these in the traditions, especially in the, in, in, the, uh, in the living out of, uh, of how they're articulated, you know. Um, especially in worship services, for example, or, or, or community services. Um, and that's fine. That gives us a different perspective uh, on, on, the re on, the, on the ultimate reality. And the world, the world would be a, a much, uh, would, be, would be in a, a, a much worse place if, if there weren't all these traditions to, uh, to reflect the beauty and the glory of, of, of absolute reality. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can just follow up there on something kind of specific, which is um, yes. mentioned the word justice, for example. Yes, right. But I think an Abrahamic understanding of justice tilts it in a certain way. And I'm curious to know how you have understood a, a Buddhist understanding of justice as similar or different. Well, uh, I, I like the modern distinction that Richard Rohr makes a lot of between retributive justice and restorative justice. So often in the in the jail Christian tradition, you get what looks like retributive justice. You did something bad, so you're going to get punished. Okay, uh, that's a very not you know primitive view, view of justice. You know you do want to restore balance, but that's not the way to do it. You know modern sociologists recognize this too. It's by restoring restoring justice. You know restoring both the perpetrator and the victim, if you want to put it that way, to their true dignity. Hopefully by getting them to interact. You know as as, as sometimes happens. Uh, so by bringing every being into its full dignity, restoring the dignity that belongs to each one, this wherever injustice or, or, or uh, uh, an attack somehow on, on the dignity of a being has happened, that, that uh, both for the perpetrator and the victim, this is, this is the way to really move forward. That's what God's justice wants. God's, if you want to use the language, God wants everyone, sinner and, sin, and sinned against, to be restored to their to their full dignity and, and awareness uh, as being, if you want, use the image of the children of God and uh, of infinite value. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer your question? Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, I see um, my my friend and past colleague Mioshin has her hand up. Hi, Mioshin. Welcome. Hi, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, hi. Um, this might touch on the concept, uh, but um, I wonder if you can speak more um, on uh, Jiriki and Tariki. Jiriki, you know, um, I think yeah. uh, more of an emphasis for Zen, Zen practitioners. Jiriki uh, meaning reliance on. on and well, thank you. Yes. And Tariki is so, on, on the other. Um, yeah. And I'm also thinking of um, that emphasis is on, uh, it's not so much for Catholic Christians, but for um, Protestant Christianity in which I'm trained. Yeah. Um, tariki is the word, you know. Um, yes. Yes. And um, I'm thinking specifically on Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. Right, right. It is a gift exactly, from, yeah. God, from the other, the holy other. Exactly, um, exactly. Lest any any anyone should boast. So right, right. It works, but should lest anyone should boast. So you know, work works are really de-emphasized in Protestant Christianity. And I often struggled with that because that kind of relates to cheap grace. But um, yes. 
me, Zen, in that regard, Zen and, and Protestant Christianity are irreconcilable. <laughs> um, and All right, well, let me, let me, okay, well, let me address that. Um, Christianity has tended to emphasize the guilt, the difference, the separation between us and God. Uh, so, uh, nonetheless, as I said earlier, what comes to us, you know, to wake up to our true self, to our union with God, is, is a gift. I would use the word grace. When I was speaking to the Japanese, remember I mentioned that a moment ago, and they said they didn't even realize there was contemplation. I said, and I, I, I brought up this issue of tariki and jiriki, uh, and I said, now I bet you, in your own practice, would would recognize the fact, even though you're trained in the self power kind of thing, that when you actually wake up, or if you actually wake up and you experience the oneness and the beauty and the vastness, it's a gift. It didn't come from you, your ego self. It didn't come from your own efforts even. You might've paved the way a little bit as you could, but even that you know, is a grace as we would say in Christianity. So it always comes from beyond anything that we you know, and our ego self could accomplish. So it's coming from, but is it an other? But there is no other. <laughs> so you see what I mean? We're, we're, we ultimately we realize that oh, we are one with this, but we have to. You have to. You have to. But we're it, the 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 realization and the enlightenment comes from a much deeper depth than anything that our ego or our own efforts, you know, that could you know ever ever acquire. So it's the experience of precisely of grace. By grace, you have been saved, even in Zen. You know, it's not your own efforts or your own. It's coming from way, way deeper. Uh, and it comes, you know, it can come, as you know, the, the Satori experience comes like, a, like, often comes, you know, like, like a, a lightning bolt, you know, like a thunderclap, because it's not something that you've done. It comes from reality's deeper depths itself, and it's a gift. It's a gift. Uh, so that's, that's the way I experience it, and that's the way I see it. And when I said that to them in Japan, they all agreed. They didn't argue with that at all. They realized, oh, this this really isn't just it's way beyond anything I could ever have obtained. You know, I'm just I'm in my own imagination or, or, or efforts. You know. So uh, so that's how I would approach it. It really is experienced as a grace in in all traditions, even if we make an effort, you know, even if we pave the way. You know, uh, for uh, by by indulge, engaging in the practice. Uh, and you know, setting setting ourselves up for the great for the great surprise and the great gift. You know? But I agree. Sue Christianity tends to overemphasize our separation and almost never gets beyond the union. You don't hear much in evangelical circles about oneness with God or union with God, whereas whereas uh, for example, the Orthodox Christianity, you know, it, it speaks about deification. You become de deification, theosis. You know, it, we're, we're deified, and it's actually in the New Testament we share the divine nature. We become one with God. So that helps us to re-emphasize. Re, re uh, so you see how they can help each other there. Uh, Zen helps us to Christianity to realize. Well, let's talk a little bit more about our oneness with God. And Christianity can tell you know Buddhism. You know, don't forget, it's not you. It's not yourself that's doing this. It's coming from way beyond, way deeper than what you understand, literally understand, conceptualize as yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Miyoshin, for your question. Um, Kim, I see you have your uh, electronic hand up. Please go ahead and unmute. And uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm coming from the Netherlands as a British Anglican, living in the Netherlands, having worked for almost 20 years in the field of uh, asylum and refugees. So in a highly polarized uh, situation with a lot of different opinions, um, a lot of fear yeah. and hatred. So I always take these issues to a very practical level. And one of the things that you kept saying was, to make peace, we must be peace, or if we want justice, be peace. Um, and so how do you see the, you know, the everyday challenging of injustice at the level of being peace? What does that look like? 
Uh, well, thank you. You could probably answer that better than I could because you're the one that's doing it. You're the one that's doing that out in the field. Out in the field. Uh, yeah, to, to, to be rooted in that peace, which is ultimate reality is peace, light and joy, you know, even in the, the darkness that's beyond the human, human life. Uh, uh, so always to go back to that and then to realize your oneness with everyone, including not just with the refugees, but with the opponents. Um, uh, if you come from that place, but at the same time, of course, you, because you recognize the, the infinite dignity and beauty and Buddhahood or Christ, Christic, uh, uh, Christic nature of, of the people you're dealing with, uh, you, you do want to make sure that justice is given to them, that restorative justice I was talking about a minute ago, to make sure everyone has the full dignity, full respect, uh, and the full opportunity to live a full life uh, that they, they, they deserve by their very being, you know, as, as, as being, uh, as, as Ellen would say, you know, manifestations of the inconceivable uh, to recognize that, that vast dignity. So you would see the dignity of everyone involved and, and try to uphold that uh, and maintain, you know, an equanimity and, and not yield to one of the poisons, you know, anger and hatred which none of you nonetheless experience around you, as you say, you have to deal with that in people as well. Um, so that, that's all I would say, just uh, to, to keep rooted in the practice. Um, and, and many, many thanks for the wonderful work you're doing there. Thank you. I would just say that one of the issues is that um, both in Buddhist, but also Christian and in general, you know, circles, being peace is often conflated with keeping the peace, which yes, often means want... keeping quiet. Yes, so, so you know, any calm. yeah, any hint of of challenge is seen as not being peaceful or not yeah. keeping the peace. And that yeah. is the biggest challenge that I face. In yeah, well, my that's world. false. That's, that's right. That, that's we want to have good trouble, as we just said. And, and the good trouble is by, by your compassion, you're working for the dignity of all and including, you know, conver converting necessary, if necessary, the, the, the ones who are opposing it. Uh, being peace doesn't mean, you know, keeping the peace. Uh, St. Augustine had the most famous definition of peace in the, in the Catholic tradition we call the tranquillitas ordinis, the tranquility of order. But the order here is not the status quo. The tranquility of order is the order of the way things ought to be if everyone is really living from and in their full dignity. Uh, so any piece that's not uh, working within or for uh, the full dignity of all, the which is true peace, is not real peace. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm sure you won't be intimidated by that kind of false reasoning. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, Jeff, I see you have your hand up. Please go ahead and unmute. Thank you for... Uh, for stepping up. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to be careful about the way I ask this. Uh, Father, you're, you're certainly not the first Catholic priest or monk I've come across over the years who was also a Zen practitioner, Zen teacher. I realize this is a, um, a phenomenon, a process that's been going on for at least a few decades. Um, if Contemplative practice, Zen practice, brings one to a point, if it moves one beyond paternalism, authoritarianism, retribution, mindsets that I, um, that you, I think, rightly call primitive, how, I mean, I, it's hard for me to conceptualize how one then remains an official representative, for lack of a better term, of a tradition that that has a, a specifically defined body of, or a body of specifically defined doctrines that exist within a framework of these concepts? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, each, each person has to answer that, that, that question for, for himself. Um, for, for me, uh, first of all, I felt from the time I was 13, you know, a strong call to be a Catholic priest, you know, and I feel that that energy and that joy and that surge every single day. So the first answer why I stay is because I'm called. That's why I stay. So why would I be called? Well, 
I feel honored to be able to represent what the real tradition is. We just spoke about world tradition beyond world tradition. So the real world tradition of Christianity that goes back to the beginning with the gospels and the mystics and the fathers of the church, which is so little spoken about, as I've been saying all along, that's what I, I'm so energized and enthusiastic about representing. I almost want to save the, the real tradition you know, from, from itself or, or present the real tradition, the full tradition you know, to, to others, you know, to, to the world to say, look, there's something, there's a pearl of great price here buried in the field you know, of your own heart, actually. So, the, and here's how you can access it according to the rules of, you know, the, the, the practices and the, the traditions of uh, within Christianity itself, if you just look for them, as well as, you know, nourished by and challenged by other traditions, as we've just been saying, to help us wake up to, to what, what, what we have, what the riches we do have. Uh, and yes, in my own way, to be able to, to work against what I think are deformations of the tradition or blind spots, you know, or that's become rigid and, and, and based them on fear and on false traditions, you know, which, which that kind of those barnacles grow in every tradition. That's, that's what Jesus fought against with the scribes and the Pharisees and that made him so angry is, you know, the, the, the falsification. So it's always a temptation in, in human life. But I, 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 I don't, I try to remain humble, you know, in trying to discern those things. Uh, but I also, uh, well, to use what Richard Rohr says about his alternative orthodoxy, as he calls Franciscanism, you know, the, the best, the best, the best uh, uh, criticism of the, of, of the bad is the practice of the good. So I don't waste my time saying, oh, look at this, this is bad, we have to, I just present what the thing really is and say, you know, you experience it for yourself, you make your own decisions about, you know, where you think we are and what needs to go and what needs to, to, to stay. Uh, I, I don't go preaching and saying that this has to change uh, so much as I just say, this is what this is what the real tradition is. What do you think the consequences are? You find them for yourself and then you go out as you may be called, you know, to work in, in, in various ways. So for me, it's interfaith. I feel called to work in interfaith. I also, as my website says, uh, feel called to work in LGBTQ, you know, ministry, get, being more welcoming to the LGBT community uh, within Christianity, within the world. So within within the specific uh, the location of my priesthood, I do feel these these particular calls uh, that I've been pursuing for a couple of decades now outside the monastery. Uh, so, so these are all reasons I stay. Uh, the main one being that I feel called to represent the authentic tradition as I've experienced it in the monastery and beyond of union with God and union with one another and how that's achieved and, and what, the, what the consequences are for our lives. But what is it that calls you, mm -hmm. if I may ask? What's that? What is it that calls what? you? What calls you? What, is, is it a being who calls you? Is it... <laughs> well, in Christianity, we call God, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, we call it a vocation, you know? No, and no, I, think I, everyone I, know, has one. I know what vocation is, I, but if we're moving beyond the concept of a, a, a personal paternalistic God, who or what is it that calls you? Well, I, I can, I, I'm, I'm happy still to use, the, to use the word God, understanding as Jesus kept the word father. I would say the, uh, to use Cotillard de Chardin, the great Jesuit mystic, you know, who was a scientist from the last century. Uh, love is the fundamental energy of the universe. Dante said the same thing. But what you experience in enlightenment is that this, there's a, a love, an energy, a power, a joy, a light, a, a gift. Uh, how is that not personal or conscious? Transpersonal, anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's what I experience. That's what I experience. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Jacqueline, I see your hand. If you'd like to unmute, please. Okay. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that um, uh, in terms of, uh, of the dam. I, I, I understand the damage that Catholicism has done and the great good, but it's the same for Buddhism. And we forget that sometimes in the West. Um, I've been working a yeah. lot with women in Buddhism and... Yeah. And women are, are have been the the teaching has been that you can't become enlightened in a female body. It's, it's a, that's a teaching. It's been very patriarchal, and yet I love Buddhism, and I'm called to 
to Buddhism. So it has, we sometimes forget Buddhism has just as deep a shadow as other religions. I remember I was trained by a Sri Lankan monk. And one of the things he said is no wars have been fought in the name of Buddhism. Well, oh, well, well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I had, I had, I had to, I had, I had to come to terms myself with my own anger and disillusionment about Buddhism not being um, prime better than other religions <laughs> and because yeah. i did i i thought okay i finally found something that's better than other religions but it isn't it's got just as no. large of a shadow and um it's it's been um a very personal journey for me to um try and understand how i can embrace both the shadow and the light of of, of a, a given system, because all system and 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 I've been um, <laughs> uh, dis. Well, I, I can't think of the word. I I I was I've been I was illu- in an illusion that one system was better than another, and I've come to the place where I don't believe that anymore. I think, you know, people screw up every single system and people do fabulous things within every single system. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you for saying that because all systems as systems have their shadow. This is all individuals, all persons as persons have their shadow. Uh, And if we don't think Buddhism sometimes works against peace, just ask the Rohingya. Right, so. so absolutely, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, we, we have a bit more time if there are other questions or comments or observations or clarifications anyone would like to share. And if not, we, uh, Michael, we can, uh, unless, unless, uh, if you'd like to, <clears throat> if you'd like to uh, add anything to kind of uh, close this out and, 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 and cap on the ending, on the ending time here, we could do that. Well, and maybe I just add this, you know, I, I sometimes say to people that um, in order to be a human being on the planet today, a civilized human being, I think every person should uh, know the religions of the world and more than one religion of the world. Not necessarily practice them, it depends on the individual circumstance and calling <laughs> uh, and, and everything, but, uh, but to be aware of the great religious traditions of the world. Uh, uh, I think that's not true today. Young people going to college like Columbia and Barna right around the corner from me here in New York City, uh, they don't study this. You know, for the most part, you know, there are no theology courses that they take. It's all business and computers and science, whatever. Uh, so uh, I think it's important that these traditions uh, not not be lost, um, and that we become more literate. You know, like Houston Smith, for example, who was not only a, a great uh, investigator of the traditions, but a practitioner of multiple, you know, multiple like he was a quadruple belonging or quintuple belonging. Yeah. Uh, so that would kind of be an ideal. I know, and I, and I know that everyone's called to dedicate their lives to exploring religion, <laughs> but I think we need a basic literacy, uh, especially if, if uh, to prevent any religious wars in the, in the future. Yeah.